do you feel like there's a hope for prosperity in the future of, uh, of mankind? Mankind, yeah. yeah. Well, with great, an enormous change that's happened during my lifetime is that when I was your age, I believed in reason and progress. Mm. And now that's just completely smashed. The whole aspect of the world and the way it's going and the way people are motivated just has altered beyond recognition, it seems so to me. I mean, even the time, you know, when one thought, not that the Soviet Union was the future, I have seen the future and it works, not that, but that socialism was, of course, this new Greek prime minister is a socialist, mm. but also he's got a strange ally, hasn't he? And when you think of what's happening in Africa, it's just yes, terrible, it's, terrible. Yeah. And what's happening in the Black Sea area and the Ukraine and I mean people are being motivated by religion and I find that really true. But going back fifty years, I mean I think it was the same. But when you think about South America mm. and Africa and the armed groups, mm. whether or not it, was, it would hold up to examination, but, you know, someone like Che Guevara, yeah. the, the idea was, you know, reason and progress. Mm -hmm. And that's hardly ever, <laughs> that's yeah. hardly ever referred to now. Yeah. I mean, it's trying to, you know, Boko Haram, trying to get back to the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me it's the, you know, the the impulse that is driving them has just turned around 180 degrees. Perhaps it's to do with the funding. I think perhaps when you end up with these uh, fundamentalists, these extremists, getting huge funds coming their way because perhaps of uh, access to oil or oil fields, yes. that sort of thing and then funds and weapons find their way into the hands of uh, warfarers, you know, warmongers. Yes. So it's a chaotic time now, but do you feel like there's hope for the future in spite of that? Or? I hope there's hope for the yeah. future, let's put it like that. Yes. Now I think that to believe that there was, to really strongly believe there was hope for the future, you'd have to be motivated by one of these mm. um, religion, religions or um, So you're not religious beliefs. yourself? So you, do you have a do you have faith? Yeah. No. No, no. no. A atheist? Agnostic. Agnostic. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm Jewish. Yeah. Um, like, but unlike so many Jewish poets, especially in Russia, I haven't been tempted by Christianity. Yeah. Um, no, I'm fascinated by religion. I've always read a lot of sociology and anthropology mm. and so on. You know, why people behave the way they do, you know, <laughs> is extraordinarily interesting and one could say depressing sometimes, mm. but luckily, you know, everyone's different. Mm -hmm. you know. I wanted to ask you about your husband. I wanted yes. to ask how you met. This. He was a young, and we were both children. Mm -hmm. I was 20 and he was 23. And he'd been in, in a sanatorium because he got, he got tuberculosis when he That's was right. yeah. in Malaya doing mm -hmm. his military service. And so, and then he had a pension and he was walking around looking very handsome as far as I was concerned. And there was this bookshop that was owned by some man who liked the idea of having a literary salon. So every Saturday, he and his wife would open their hand. They, he, he'd talk to people in the shop if he liked the look of them. Like you're doing this interview, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's how I met Alan. 
And you, you travelled somewhat with them? You... Oh yes, we, then we, we left England quite soon and we went and lived in the south of France and then in Mallorca because that's as 1950s, this isn't 50 years ago, this is 65 years yeah. ago or 60 years ago, yeah. And at that time, you know, I mean now Mallorca is a great holiday destination, mm. as you know, but at that time there was just a little landing strip mm. for planes, you know, and I remember we were living in a small town on the north side of the island. It was a known place, but not a, not a holiday destination. It sounds quite romantic, I sort of imagine. It you was know. very, very romantic, yeah. yeah. A lot of sunshine. <laughs> Oh, I've never been so cold. You, you can be so cold in the Mediterranean in yeah. the winter because the houses, they have tiles on the floor and just plaster walls. Mm. They get so damp. We got fed up because we were living on his pension. Mm. And of course the cost of living inexorably rose. And we gave English lessons and you know, things like that. Um, but we got fed up. We'd been there for four years. Yeah. And Alan had written Saturday night and Sunday morning and it had been rejected by about half a dozen publishers. And one of them said, you don't know anything about the working class. <laughs> Imagine. A man who was a... Um, an Austrian refugee from the war, mm. yeah. He, he was a very successful publisher, but anyway, he didn't know anything about a working class novel. Um, so he didn't publish it, and then he just ate his liver, you know, that he lost out. Good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, got, we thought we'd come back to England. And we weren't married. And Alan wasn't Jewish, mm. and we had ten pounds in the world, and so we went to my parents' house and just dumped ourselves there for about three or four weeks, and then we went and dumped ourselves on some friends in London. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we, but he had the manuscript, you see, of Saturday night and Sunday morning, and. There was a very nice Romanian woman who was acting as, a, as his agent. And she said, well, I've got one more publisher to try. Mm. And if, if he doesn't take it, if they don't take it, perhaps you should really reconsider your future. <laughs> anyway, so this publisher took it and gave us some money as an advance. And I got a job. You know the sort of jobs one does. At that time it was market research. Good. Yeah. So, which was very interesting because I've been out of England for over five years, getting on for six. And it was a reintroduction. And also it was t I could go into people's houses, you see, knock on the door. Mm. May I ask you a few questions? May I film you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Was it like it would have been like an old, probably a wind up camera? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you meet Sylvia Platt was that during that time? Yes. How I met Sylvia Platt. Alan had been given a very prestigious literary award mm. for Saturday night. What a long distance one, I can't remember. Because they were published as one, oh. you know, in the, the next year. Uh, one after the other. So the procedure was that the person who held the award gave it to the next one. Uh -huh. And the person who was getting it was Ted Hughes. Uh -huh. And so Alan and I went to this place in St. James's Square where this ceremony was going to take place. And we met Ted Hughes and Sylvia Platt. 
And the sort of parallels were really quite extraordinary because there was the man who was a great success, North Country, working class, Saturnine, you know, etc., etc. And there were the two American poets. Because Sylvia had published a book. I hadn't published a book yet. She was ahead of me, and she already had a child, and I was pregnant, but didn't have the child yet. Um, and so Sylvia and I just looked at each other, you know, and it seemed that everything was just a, you know, a mirror image practically. Mm. Yeah. But the thing is that they had already bought a house in Cornwall, Devon, sorry, Devon, and they were going in a couple of months down to Devon. And I was going to have a baby. And that was more problematic than it might have been because I'd had several miscarriages. And so we saw each other about four or five times in this yeah. interval because, you know, we just liked each other immensely. And Alan and Tech, the same thing happened. Not, not the same thing, of course, but I mean, they liked each other. It was very nice. And um, then they went, and then I saw Sylvia a couple of times because she came up to London, you know, to do something at the BBC mm -hmm. to get a prize and things like that. Because she was very ambitious and very good at doing it all. So my son David was born, mm -hmm. and then a couple of months later, or maybe only six weeks later. Very soon, we went down to Devon for the weekend to see the house, to see them, to show off my baby. Sylvia also had a new baby, that's right. Nicky, Nicholas. And we spent the weekend together. It was quite intense. And that's when she dedicated that poem, Elm, to me, you know, which is sort of literary history, yeah. She dedicated it to me because it was the poem on her desk that she was working on, not because she'd written it for me. Yeah. Yeah. But it was at the time. Yes. Yeah. And so, and then we went to Tangier and we were coming back to England because Alan had been invited by the Union of Writers in Moscow mm. to go there, and of course he was very interested to go, and he wanted to go. But the thing is that I had made all sorts of elaborate arrangements that Sylvia and I, while Alan was in the Soviet Union, mm. would go down to the house in Devon, because they, she and Ted had split up, mm -hmm. so they weren't living together anymore. And so we were going to have a holiday there, she and I, and the, and the babies, three babies, two of hers and one of mine. And I took, this really sounds crazy, I took my Moroccan maid yeah. back here, to, so that she would look after the babies while Sylvia and I would be talking about poetry and yeah. such wonderful poetic things. And about a week before we were due to leave, when I was packing up the house that we rented, you know, getting all our stuff together, Alan came up to the house. Uh, with the Observer newspaper, which was probably about five or six days old. And I opened it and there was the, the news about Sylvia, death. Such a terrible shock, such a terrible, terrible, terrible. As 
a poet, you observe yourself all the time. That's the basis of it. Well, that's the basis of it for me. Um, and I, I, you know, I have to admit to the most terrible impulses and <laughs> motives, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, your behaviour, as far as I can tell, is environmentally determined, so that you really uh, are the product of your conditioning, and you you know as you go across your life, and you you have certain behaviours reinforced and rewarded, and other behaviours aren't. And so, if you live as we do in a culture with such a false value system and such a false um, system of reinforcing and rewarding behaviour. How is there any chance that you can come out of the other end of that with anything other than a false value system yourself? You know? It's very, very unlikely, I think, that you're going to uh, be repeating behaviours which aren't rewarded. Yes. And, but those often are the morally correct or altruistic behaviours. Throughout history, the examples are shown of uh, men and women who, through doing the right thing, got themselves incarcerated, assassinated, ridiculed, yes. yeah, so on. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But then, luckily, people like that do emerge constantly. Mm. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they seem to contradict every aspect of their conditioning and social conditions. Mm. And be, you know, and they, they're immensely generous and charitable and noble and you know they're sort of like saints in a way aren't they true yeah i mean it was recently um a movie came out about martin luther king dr martin luther yes, king yes selma you so. have, i haven't seen it yet yeah. yeah is it good it is good yeah i mean it, it's hard i think when you're dealing with that like you're saying it's sort of a saintly man as long as they're relatively accurate it's hard for it not to be good you know because yes. it's just such stimulating subject yes. matter and uh, um, I, so it does give one hope, I think, when you take a look at the lifetime of a person like that and you see just how against all the odds it can happen that these, these compassionate leading lights are sort of erupt out of the human experience. Yeah, yeah. that's right, like lights flares from the sun, mm. you know, the mass of the sun and then these flares come out. And that would be someone who supersedes, overrides their con conditioning mm. and what one would expect. Specifically, actually, Martin Luther King, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, the son. Yes, because, yeah, he, yeah um, his father was a preacher, so wasn't he? Yes, but son, not the son that the flares are coming out of. No. The son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was, uh, he, his foundation of his um, philosophy was uh, non-violence and that's something which means a great deal to me and um, something which I feel is sort of necessary if we are going to have some prosperity in the future of humankind. I think cultures around the world need to um, adopt that as a core part of their value system. Do you think that um, prosperity is the exact correct word? Kind I of. mean, it's necessary, the, yeah. you know, income equalization, mm -hmm. or, which would mean that there'd be moderate prosperity for everyone yeah. on the planet. Of course, is something devoutly to be worked for and hoped for. Yeah. Yeah. But it just sounds as if it's only... It's too material, Too it? material, yeah. that's the word. That Yes, I mean, <clears throat> my feeling is that sort of material prosperity can give rise to, uh, um, you know, immaterial prosperity. Yeah, of course, because when you have time. Exactly, yeah. You're not, yeah. You're not slaving away in, in a brickyard 12 hours a That's day. That's it. Yeah. And there's this idea of access abundance, where yeah. you have a scenario where all the people of the earth can get access to proper medical facilities, proper educational facilities, proper housing, mm -hmm. decent food and clean water and air and all that <coughs> and that is a very material thing but it's you know it, and then could you imagine how little crime there'd be if everyone was provided for no one out of desperation had to that's right 
So that's my that's my hope that through sort of science and technology we will create um, a access yeah. abundance, yes. and that will be the foundation of uh, a a much more blissful and sort of happy um, interconnected world. How lovely! How lovely! Lovely vision of the future.